Hello, good afternoon, welcome to DIA. My name is Humberto Moro and I'm Deputy Director of Program. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this listening session of May Abnisha Never Kisses on the Mouth by artists Basil Abbas and Ruan Aburam, which is co-commissioned by DIA and the Museum of Modern Art. An expansion of the digital platform originally launched in December 2020, the project currently features an extensive collection of the artist's online recordings of people singing and dancing in communal spaces in Iraq, Palestine, and Syria, layered with new performances created with collaborators from Palestine. Today, I have the honor to present Basel and Ruan in conversation with cultural theorist, poet, and professor Fred Moten, and NYU's Performance Studies PhD candidate, Alia Alsabi. I'm going to pass it over to Nasser Abu Ram, faculty fellow at NYU. Or, but before, I want to thank our speakers for joining us tonight and remind everyone to visit diaart.org to explore the Basel and Rouen project. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, for, Humberto, very much for that. I just want to quickly welcome everybody on behalf of NYU's Kevorkian Center, and I want to thank Dia, everyone at Dia involved in this, uh, Theodora, Humberto, Jordan, Kelly, not just for co-hosting this, but for really kind of co-producing this. Um, this listening session is the final event in our two-day conference called Global Uprising. This was a conference that really at its base was a kind of space to take pause and reflect, learn from and with this last decade of popular struggle, with this present that we've been trying to think about as a generalized insurgency. And so we spent two days kind of talking about big and really irresolvable concepts and questions like revolution and decolonization. And the listening session today is meant to draw on that, but really depart from it. Right? It's meant to depart from it in the sense that it's meant to connect it with a host of other questions that come out of the May Amnesia project that Humberto uh, just introduced. Questions around everyday ritual, questions around aesthetics, performance, the claiming of space, questions around loss and mourning and their strange proximity sometimes to celebration and festivity. Um, and questions around, I would say, dispossession, not just as a kind of mode of government, but as a, a place to speak from. Um, so this is not an artist talk in any kind of conventional sense. It's going to be structured around um, sort of collected items, collected material, mainly from Palestine, but also performance pieces that come out of the project, as well as kind of extracts from the installation, which is forthcoming. Um, like Humberto mentioned in, at MoMA. And our speakers are going to sort of watch and listen and then talk and converse with each other around it. And we're going to leave about half an hour at the end for all of us to kind of get pitched in and, and, and try, to, try to contribute to that. So um, that's it from me. Please join me in giving them a warm welcome. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. and. Of course, thank you for uh, being here and accepting our invitation to listen with us. Um, I'm going to quickly just try to introduce the project so we can get to the listening part as quickly as possible. So, um, May Amnesia Never Kiss Us on the Mouth has been a work we've been kind of working on for about 10 years, more or less. Um, and even though it starts with... Um, essentially a collection of material that we collected online um, of everyday performances, as was mentioned earlier, uh, mostly from Iraq, Syria, and Palestine. It actually, um, it actually goes back to like a gesture that is, starts more around 2011, 2010 with the revolutions that were kicking off in, in Egypt and in Tunis. And basically, it wasn't a work or a project, it was more like a gesture of trying to share material or save material and sort of engage with this material from a distance in Palestine. So part of the Arab world, but also isolated from it and engaging with it online. So that was kind of just uh, the gestures that then, you know, obviously the, the situation on the ground changed, but so did the material that we were 
kind of collecting and sharing and saving. And this material was mainly perf of performance, and we didn't know why we were sh why we were saving this material in the beginning, but then um, slowly it became um, more apparent that we that you know these were like important moments of. Um, not just kind of communally bearing witness to us a moment, but also um, a kind of reclamation to space that we'll sort of get into more. Um, so <clears throat> the other f kind of phase of the project was we then took this material and we used it as source material and we worked with other performers and a dancer, three electronic musicians more specifically, and a dancer in Palestine. And for about two, three years, we were kind of using this collection that we had put together as source material for creating new performances. Um, and so today what we will be looking at is some of these material, uh, well we created an online platform out of this material and we're also going to, uh, as mentioned before, at MoMA we're going to have an installation which will be the first, it's, uh, the first let's, let's say physical iteration of the sound and video work. Um, so we'll be looking at material from the online platform, which is the collection, the archive, let's say, and the performances that we created. But we'll also look at um, a sort of like simulation of the installation or like an extract of what we'll be playing at MoMA. So to kind of go through all the transformations. Um, did I miss anything or can I, shall I start? No, to say that we're gonna play some and discuss. Yeah, and then, yeah, exactly. Then the, the um, the format that we're gonna be um, playing it in is we're gonna play a few sounds and then sort of, I'll just briefly sort of say what it is we're looking at and then try to sort of open it up and discuss uh, what we just heard, something along those lines. Um, yeah, so I'll just start and play the first thing. Um, this is um, essentially, so this is from the May uprisings in Jerusalem last year. Um, Specifically, this is a chant that um, um, so repeats, um, those, who, um, those who chant will not die, do not die. Uh, and then any video you can kind of press, but I'm not gonna, okay. Yeah. 
play now a wedding from Bire in the West Bank. Okay, so I'm going to play one last thing before we... This is um, the funeral of uh, Basil al-Araj, who was a revolutionary thinker that was killed uh, by the Israelis in March of 2017. Um, and this was his funeral in Al-Walaje, uh, which is um, a village uh, close to Bethlehem. Um, so I think we'll 
take a pause there and try to open it up to some conversation between us. And maybe I can give a little more context um, about what we just heard and, and saw and you know what we found to be significant in this material that we selected. Um, the first cluster that we played was really, yeah, centered around the May uprisings last year in Palestine. That scene was from Jerusalem outside the old city. Um, and the f what he was uh, saying was, raise your hands, raise your voice, those who chant, do not die. Um, and uh, I think for us it was really thinking about how sound and music and chants um, are a very important resistant practice, but also there is this idea in that line, those who chant do not die, which is very much about the resonance of sound. You know, how sound, the inscriptions, and also the echoes that it carries. So a, a lot of uh, what we're thinking through and, and looking at is um, the inscriptions that are kept in people, in communities, um, in the land itself, and an echo that does not die, that is so kind of beautifully expressed in that uh, first video. Um, I want to keep my reflections really brief. There's obviously the performances, there's the movement and the, the gesture of the raising of the arms that was um, also something very powerful for us and for the, for the performers. Um, but moving on to the second video that we saw, that was a wedding uh, in the Bira. And, and essentially what's happening there is that it starts off as a regular wedding song that they're singing together. Um, there's a call and response. And at some point it becomes uh, a narration of um, essentially being taken by the army, being imprisoned, being beaten, and there is no real shift in the register or the tone. So it's, there's also something in it very that's very coded. So you could even miss that something has shifted. Um, and that has a very long history in Palestine because people could not gather physically from the period of the British colonization, actually. The wedding, which is a site of social ritual, also beca becomes a site for political gathering um, and kind of certain kind of political articulations. And from that period, wedding songs were transformed into songs of um, resistance. And there's this very kind of um, unceremonial way in which it moves between these registers, right? Um, and, okay, I'm going to keep this brief because I want Ali and Fred to talk more than me, but um, the last video is the funeral procession, and that um, ties in very strongly because the form that it takes is a zephy, which is essentially a, proce a procession that would have been performed to get the groom from his house. Um, and some of the sentences and even the rhythms of how they're singing would have been on, from some of those songs. Um, so it's, it's, it's very much, you know, thinking about how the mourning of martyrs is also the celebration, right? So it's... Um, Yeah, it's a very kind of complex thing in a in a way um, that these moments are celebrated as well. So I don't know if I think I'm gonna kind of stop there because there's so much I could say, but I want to open it up. I hope that I gave some kind of idea of why we played these things together. Um, Alia, Fred, I don't know. I guess I'll um, just add on that. I 
you know, spent so much time on this archive and also we've had several conversations, you know, uh, looking through it, thinking about it. And I just, I just want to speak to the sort of the alchemy that's created between um, the, the, the YouTube videos, the recordings that you've collected um, and what you've shown us and uh, the commissioned performances. Um, I feel like there's sort of this interesting relationship between the collected and the constructed, the archive being the constructed and the performances being commissioned and the landscape footage that you recorded. Um, and like the energy that that produces in the archive where um, it somehow generates this elusive quality, like the echoes that you mentioned, the reverberations across the sound and the movements and, um, and, and also just like in terms of the sonic quality of like the, the sort of the protest and the wedding celebration and the funeral procession, all having this certain charge that is then contrasted by a more meditative quality of the performers. Um, that somehow, I don't know, as you peel away the, the layers, because the archive is layered, um, it gives a way to a stillness um, that I find really interesting because, I don't know, I think it's, the stillness is an essence of like the spirit of the land and people here who may have been to Palestine, I think, um, might know that there is a, like a s very palpable stillness to the land um, amidst the brutality and the violence and the occupation. Like there is a sort of very predominant stillness to the, like the landscape and the hillsides um, that I sense very clearly in, in the archive. And I, and I think uh, there's something really powerful about that because it sort of transcends um, the cacophony of like sound and image. Um, so yeah, there's a lot more to say about that, but I, I just think this sort of, the, the, this elusive alchemy is, is, I think, really powerful. Well, um, so I, I have, um, I feel like I have nothing to say and then a whole lot of stuff to say. Um, I, um, Well, there's a kind of disorientation that happens for me looking um, or experiencing this work, which is that, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm very, you know, wary, you know, of art these days. <laughs> and and uh, I mean, I love it. You know, that's why I'm so wary of it, because it feels like one has to, to, to resist certain elements of it, certain, certain metaphysical assumptions that undergird the idea of the artist and the idea of the artwork. Um, and those, those assumptions, I think, primarily have to do with, 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 with sort of individuality, individuation, the, the sort of bounded, you know, uh, bordered singularity of a work and, and of the person who makes the work and of the person who receives the work. And then at the same time, those, um, those bordered sort of bounded singularities have to then be understood in terms of that they somehow bear uh, or enact a kind of three-dimensionality, um, a kind of fullness that, that, that makes up for the sociality that is refused in the very idea of the singular work, you know? And um, so every once in a while when I see art, I'm disoriented by the fact that this particular, what I'm seeing is going against the grain of those things. <laughs> and that's what, that's my disorientation here, is that what you're doing makes me want to backslide and have faith in art again, <laughs> you know, so. Um, and, and it does that, I think, by way of a couple of different elements that are, and I, I know that even in talking about it this way, I'm sort of moving away from 
or it seems like at least on the first instance, I'm not considering the content, but I am, but I am. Uh, but, but it seems like right now I'm just talking in a purely formal way. But, but this morning when I was looking, but looking isn't even the right word. When I was, <clears throat> okay, like I was, look, to say looking implies that, you know, that there was this object like a screen in front of me and it was separate from me. Um, but, but it was also another experience that was akin to immersion. I don't think either one of those terms are right. Um, and so that's also part of the disorientation. But, but, but when I was going through it, I guess I would say, um, I was in love with the fact that, that there were multiple screens within the screen or pictures within the picture that I could that I, could, that I had to work myself. I had to initiate the movement and I had to manipulate the sound and create my own mix, um, which struck me as like a really, a beautiful thing in the sense that, uh, you know, like, sorry, I'm gonna ramble for just one more minute, but yet today, Yesterday, I was totally pissed off about the fact that I had to get a new computer the other day. And it does all this stuff that I don't want it to do. And, and it does this thing where it gives you a, two desktops, right? And I kept losing, like, it was like, where was what I was just doing? It just disappeared. And I remember I was talking to doing, having office hours, and I totally had to ruin this student's office hours by getting them to help me figure out how to get this thing. That, and, um, and now I realize why I was so pissed off, because I don't want two desktops. I want the complexity and the depth. I'm tired of the way that Apple and Microsoft are constantly trying to get me to be more efficient. And the way that they wanted to get me to be more efficient yesterday was by creating this sort of biphasic disorder where there's me working on this thing, and then there's me working on this thing. But it's no, it's me working on like six things, right? And I gotta be working on six things because the nature of the bullshit that I have to live through requires this level of complexity. And also at the same time, that's how shit is. There's more than one thing happening, and they're all mixed together. And, and, we, and, and that's different than three-dimensionality. That's different than the fake complexity of a figure that you have singularized. It's rather the richness and depth of a surface that we experience that turns out to be really complex as we, as we approach it, as we walk along it. It's a, it's a topographical complexity it's inseparable from a social complexity. Um, and so it manifests itself as this interplay between silence and, and sound within every element and then amongst the elements. And, and, and this work is beautiful because it gives us a chance to experience that and also to be in the midst of the making and the arrangement of it. And it is that experience of being in the midst of the making and arrangement of the life that you share, which oppressive, brutal, militarized settler coloniality is always in the business of trying to destroy. So that the content of the work emerges there, right? The content of the lives that are being exposed to genocidal pressure is, is, is refreshed by the forms that you produce and then allow us to engage in too. So, so that's beautiful to me. So. I think that um, that, uh, I mean, what you were saying about sort of being able to also create your own sound mix so in a way you know, f this feeling that there are all these multiple things and people and sounds here that are very much alive and you're also imbricated in it. Um, and I think that imbrication is, 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 is really uh, significant. 
And there's also, I think, that sense of incompleteness, which is very much connected to, you know, the incomplete nature of the Palestinian revolution till now. Um, so it's always in process, and it's in process through all these broken parts, essentially, that come to that do still somehow come together. Um, so there is that collective, there is that ensemble, but it is very broken. I think that is, um, it, it's sort of staying true also to that experience in a, in a way. Um, but, you know, maybe, Ali, I, I don't know if you wanted to say anything about the procession, about the funeral procession, about the we weddings, about that relationship between um, mourning and celebration? I, I feel like there's a convergence that is um, impossible to avoid. Like even the words of the sort of the wedding celebration, like I was handcuffed and blind, um, blindfolded and, you know, like describing sort of like the, the arrest as, you know, this person's going to Jerusalem and this being a, a part of a wedding celebration. I think the reality is such that, you know, wedding celebration and funeral processions and protests are all one and the same. It's really just um, um, an ever stubborn um, desire to just produce um, being and existence despite all odds and so, you know, I feel like if you weren't an Arab speaker, Arabic speaker, and you heard all these things side to side, side by side, um, you probably wouldn't know the difference between what is a funeral procession, what is a wedding celebration, what's a protest. They all sound the same, um, and I think that's that's a you know a factor of of just like um, being under occupation for many many decades, and and all these things being. A celebration of life, even those that are connected to death, um, because of martyrdom being, uh, you know, uh, sort of a life after life that doesn't end with just sort of the disappearance of a body, because there's a larger cause, and and you know we we talked about how sort of even the blood of those who are killed sort of seeps into the land, and then the land um, becomes the people that. Um, it sort of like becomes haunted by by those who fight for it. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, in terms of like the register that you mentioned, and 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 how sort of there's like a detached quality uh, to the celebration, for example, and the funeral procession and the protest that is interesting, but it's also like a quality of self-preservation. Uh, where um, um, sort of the emotion is removed as a way to uh, ensure con continuity in some ways. Um, and we talked about how that is different from, for example, the recordings that you have there from Syria and Iraq and Yemen, which are definitely very emotionally different in terms of the register, which is interesting. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk about that. I mean, I think it's interesting how there's something withheld and that withholding as a form of resistance. There's also something very coded and disguised. Um, and it has this ability to sort of almost infiltrate and evade, you know, which is, I think, very significant in Palestine because you're constantly within, you know, the 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 brutality of this settler colonial conditions you're being watched you are you know it's it's um you're in this state of like hyper visibility all the time um and so i i just find it yeah incredibly um powerful how people then kind of code their forms of resistance and it and at some point at some points it becomes more clear and audible so it has this kind of shift. So I think the first video that we saw from Jerusalem with the those who chant do not die is much more clearly 
confrontational and then the wedding is actually much more withheld right um so it's inter it's interesting how the tone doesn't actually change so they switch from like um you know talking about the the and then like basically saying what happened to them that day which is i was walking to jerusalem and the, and the kind of seamless change in the tone is also like for, like you said you know you can't tell when it's when it's this or that yeah i just wanted to add that and I was, I was, I just said that we were also going to play the, the funeral, um, the fu the, the funeral was kind of heavily also, um, the performers that we worked with, they were very much impacted by this video and they chose to sort of sample a lot of it and, and use it in there. So we thought to also play like, um, extract from that. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to play an extract from the um, installation, which is just one other articulation of the work. Uh, it's going to be quite small, unfortunately, because it's a multiple channel, so it's kind of difficult to... And it's not mixed to... I, like. I think it should give you a sense, so let's play that extract, this one. Yeah. 
I got kind of lost <laughs> in that extract of it. My mind went to different places. But um, uh, I, I suppose, you know, there's more than one thing happening here. There's the, the way in which the, um, what we did with the performers who mostly work with electronic musician, uh, music usually, they don't, use just their voices or just their bodies um, was very much to sit with the archive with each person and um, start a kind of conversation with the material and then to really use themselves as almost like a like a sampler right of that of certain refrains or gestures or movements, um, melodies, rhythms, words. Um, but it was very much uh, principled on the idea that we would get together and really improvise together. Um, so, so things would emerge through improvisation. But also that um, really thinking about what happens when you would stay in a particular thing, right? Stay. Um, and kind of linger in a broken part from a song or a movement. And it was a um, quite an intense experience, actually, for all of us, for everyone involved. Um, and with this particular uh, section, the, the song of... Um, what I would say is a kind of rageful morning, right? It's a morning full of um, rage, and it's a morning also full of life and energy. Um, but it really got translated very much in relation to the land as well. So this kind of um, almost rageful morning for the land that sort of emerges. Um, and then there's a second part, which is all the kind of sonic kind of glitches and stutters and the even more breaking apart that we're trying to do. Um, do you want to add something to that? Well, I was, <clears throat> I mean, I was thinking about land, um, which is, which is a lot of stutters and glitches. You know, I mean, that's the, <clears throat> the, the topographical complexity of it of of the surfaces that 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 we deal with and then you know d development 
certain discourses of you know freedom and ownership and all of those things you know um tend to try to smooth stuff out you know so um so what it you know and, and obviously there's a certain kind of you know discourse of taste you know aesthetic taste which is also predicated on the, the that kind of the necessity of, of regulation so so it's a dilemma, right? Because um, because a kind of a common life is is being incessantly disrupted, um, in, incessantly uh, intervened upon, um, and 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 one can't help but experience those those things, those interruptions as these sort of these 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 brutal irregularities that are imposed in the name of of regulation <laughs> you know um, and at the same time you know our response your response has to avoid uh, succumbing to or the urge to, to smooth it out, right? To, in the name of something like, like repair, you know, or, or uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's like a, you know, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a conundrum, it's a, it's a paradox. It, it's one of those kind of things that induces, you know, philosophy, you know, which is a pain in the ass, right? Like it's, it's really not, it ought not be, you know, the job of oppressed people to, to have to solve these problems, you know, to think through, you know, uh, the philosophical problems that emerge as a function of stupidity, not as a function of, you know what I mean? Like, like of, of the, 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 the mix of stupidity and brutality. Um, and it ought not be our um, job, you know, to, regu to, 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 to to have to make a case for irregularity in, in the face of the constancy of, of our, you know, of being disrupted. Now, the thing that strikes me here that's really important to say, I, I think, um, like there's all this shit I want to say that I feel like I can't say. <laughs> um, Um, well, if I say it, I'll probably get in trouble. <laughs> Not with who you, I never worry about getting in trouble with the people who, well, so we're here for various reasons and, and we're not at the Venice Biennial. Um, and I keep getting all these What what I what I guess I want to say is that um, when I was looking at the 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 scene from the funeral, clearly the funeral is is experienced by someone as a as a personal loss. It's it is. We, we don't have actually the proper term for it, but the term that we would use in the absence of the proper term is that it is a personal loss. But, but what we also know is that the, the, the imprecision of that term has massive political implications. And if the, when it, the minute we begin to imagine that we can understand or encompass that loss by calling it a personal loss. The minute that we think that we can subdivide the brutality of occupation, the brutality of slavery, the brutality of settler colonialism by way of the calculus of personal loss, so that this entire history is just one long, infinite series of personal injuries, the minute we do that, 
it's as if we've lost everything. Now, there's an art of personal injury, and it's eloquent, right? Um, but its eloquence is false. Um, and therefore to be avoided. So you might then want to make a certain equation between the fleeting mention to the Venice of the Venice, Venice painting, you know, I mean, to, what strikes me is, you know, I mean, look, I mean, the, it's weird, you know, it's, it's something to be wary of, I would imagine, about in other words, the, the, the palatability of the art of personal injury, the palatability of art which converts, which, which with good intentions wants to tap into the feeling of an individual, of, of a so-called individual's loss as if that will allow them to encompass all of what is lost, which cannot be reduced to a personal injury or a personal loss, that, that all of that good intention can produce a kind of virtuosity at the level of the aesthetic, which can also easily be folded into the commerciality of the commercialization of the aesthetic, but but that's not even real problems. I don't care about how much money somebody makes doing the art of personal injury. That's not the problem. The problem is the way in which the art of personal injury reproduces the metaphysical foundations of the structures that produce the injury. Right. That's the that's the problem. And. Um, uh, so, I think it's connected to these formal questions, uh, you know, that, that I was trying to say some about before. Um, I feel like I'm talking too much, so I will shut up now. So. It's not that it's impersonal. It's not that it's impersonal. It's more than personal. Okay, like it's not that, and, and even the detachment that you talked about, Alia, is not impersonal. It's not a detachment that, 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 can, that could, even if it wanted to, and it doesn't want to, neg negate or deflect feeling. Um, maybe, maybe what's happening is that one recognizes the intensity of the dispersion of that feeling across a social field within the context of a social field that is not predicated on the distinction between the people and the land. So it's as if the land feels the shit, <laughs> you know? Um, uh, and, and so um, that's why it's, it's, impersonal doesn't mean detached, it doesn't mean, it, it, doesn't, it, does, not, it does not negate the intensity of the loss or the feeling of a mother who is burying her son instead of marrying her son to someone. It doesn't negate that. That's still, re it's just, but, but the language that we have been given to talk about that is inadequate to that. And it's not just that it's inadequate to that, it reproduces the shit, you know. And, um, and to succumb to that in any moment I mean, it requires extraordinary vigilance, you know, and a kind of selflessness, you know, I would say, you know, to, uh, you know. so that's what I was trying to say. Um, no, I mean, um, you know, something that we sat with a lot in this project was, um, how, you know, in a lot of these moments, there is, you know, the ex this, this expression of a collective, even at times when there is an absence of a clear collective. You know, when you're talking about Palestine, 
um, you're talking about a land and a people who are intensely fragmented. So what colonial power is always trying to do is to break that collective and produce out of it these individual personal um, losses and struggles and utterances. And what was so strong for us in the, the, the material that we were collecting was the way in which it embodied all that violence, but it also resisted it. It's very much about trying to, it's almost like a spectral collective that emerges at times and at points. Um, and another thing was also the way in which this material circulates and lives online. The way that in the virtual space, which is also full of erasure and surveillance, there is this call and response that happens. And there's also um, us, it, you know, being also very in Palestine, physically disconnected and unable to reach either other Palestinians in Gaza or Jerusalem, or the material from Syria and Iraq is an absolute impossibility. So there is that real physical impossibility, but the way in which the sound carries, right, the echoes the inscriptions and, and the way in which I would say there is this very strong feeling that the, the voice is your voice and not your voice. It's your wound and not your wound. So it's, it's, it's in this space that's more than collective, I would say, right? So that, you know, um, and I, I, that's what we're trying to constantly get to as well in the way that the material or the installation is sort of like being. But I, I think that's a really important thing to think about, especially in relation to this idea of personal loss. The wound is also yours, but in a different way, right? Um, so that, that sort of like sharing of the wound and then the, the way in which song and dance becomes uh, really kind of um, significant in that, in that moment, you know? So I think, I think that, just to add to what Rowan was saying, is, is basically that, you know, with, with sound, you know, in Palestine, your, your horizon is kind of severed, right? Like visually, not just imagine, your imagination, but like your visuals as well, like your actual, uh, what you can see, there's walls and there's an end to like the horizon. So, you know, sound becomes like even subconsciously for people like a very powerful, um, um, almost like, um, you know, empowering essentially, um, formally even, not just, uh, you know, um, so a lot, a lot a, for the longest time we were really also interested in this collections from Iraq, Syria and Palestine is the sort of like non-verbal like sounds, right? That were just, you know, that again to like outsiders sound like complete um, um, gibberish, but they mean so much and they, ex you know, express so much even again just formally and on the physical and on the imaginary, in the imaginary space. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I also wanted to say that I, you know, I think the sort of the recordings that you've collected are really essentially ephemeral. Like there's so much of that. It is being produced every single day, like literally in the same instant. There's weddings, protests and funeral processions happening all at once. And, you know, the quality of these videos are low res, um, you know, like unprofessionally recorded. They're not, there's, you know, they're not... Um, they're not unique or unique objects in their own right. They're, they're sort of instances of, of sounds and scenes that are happening all the time. And I think the brilliance of like your intervention is sort of the performers, especially in the installation shot that you showed us, um, how like they slow everything down, sort of the, the, the interpretation of these sounds and movements and then the lingering on words and the you know single motion and just like the repetition of that really kind of creates um sort of um that you're looking at things through a microscope like a microscopic lens and you're like really breaking things apart and 
um, examining what it is that is actually happening. And also the inversion of color, you know, in some of the videos um, in the installation um, and how that produces like an x-ray effect. You're actually looking at the pores and the sort of the flesh and bones of, of the place. Um, um, that I think is, is really important because so much of what happens gets swept in the sort of speed and the intensity and just like the, you know, progressively deteriorating element of the situation there. So, you know, I think the sort of that, um, um, the examining of, of, of these sounds and movements that exist under a very br brutal regime um, becomes necessary. So we're going to look at um, uh, uh, um, we're going to look at some of the material now, but some of it is a sort of a lamentation from Syria that we'll see, and we'll also see like a direct confrontation with um, in Palestine with the army through like song, so like a literal song being used to confront in Palestine, yeah. And that some of the performances as well sort of uh, resonating with the uh, melodies. <laughs> Oh, 
وجد بيه وجد بيه وللي سبب هباله وجد بيه والله يا حجدم يا الطبيب العالد قليبك وقليبي ولا طبيب العالج قليبك يا حج دنيا وقليبه وجد بيه ولا وسبع اللات ما الهيين ولا يا عين انت يا سبع اللات ما تصوروش بس اسمعوا بس تصوروش ابركون احنا على بس انت لما حشرين ماشي غادي بس بس ما شاء الله ما شاء الله والاصحاب That was a, I mean, this song, um, which is Jannah, Jannah, Jannah. I think it started in Syria, right? Or Iraq? Um, and uh, loosely translated, it, it, it would, it, it's, it uh, sort of says that even my land is paradise. Even even the fires of this land are paradise. Um, so, and that was what we were seeing now when they were confronting um, the soldiers, or 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 more, they were just singing in a procession, and the soldiers um, wanted to, you know, in any way, kind of suppress that. And I think uh, in this cluster. You know, we were thinking about loss and landlessness, and um, the fact that you know um, graves were being dug up in Jerusalem and being destroyed to make way for um, new parks. So this feeling of not even having a place to be buried in the world. Um, uh, and, you know, w w what does it mean to sit with that loss? But also how can sitting with that loss um, open up this, this, this space 
to actually resist that capture, right? But, but not evading the loss. So kind of going back to what you were saying, Fred, about getting out of that politics of repair in a way. You know, sometimes um, repair is not really possible, right? Or it, it's not that we have to repair or we have to make whole. So, or we can't, it's not possible to make whole. So what happens then, right? So that's, you know, what does it mean to sit with that loss, but not in a way that just is about defeat, in a, in a kind of different um, way, so. Well, you know, it's like, you know, given, given the Im impossibility of repair, the problem isn't the idea of repair, if it were possible, okay, cool. The problem is, is what you're willing to accept, you know, in the name of repair, given the impossibility of repair. And usually what people are willing to accept in the name of repair, given the impossibility of repair, is um, acceptance. Um, which is to say, to be accepted into the already existing thing and also at the same time to accept it, you know. And, um, you know, look, I mean, I, it's just so much easier not to say any of this because um, cause then you don't have to say other shit like, I'm not talking about anybody unless I'm also talking about myself, right? Like, I'm not saying any of this as if I'm outside of it, you see, you know? And um, the distinction between the Dia Center for the Arts and the Venice Biennale fades immediately after the distinction is made, you know? It's a useful rhetorical distinction for a millisecond, you know, but you know, and then it fades away, you know. But, but, but somehow, but given that's 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 the that's the language that we have. So, so these are these are problems. These are ethical problems, I would say, and also aesthetic problems to be worked out in 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 common in in gathering, in in study, you know, and. And to the extent that, that, that certain kinds of aesthetic work, certain kinds of aesthetic practices, there are aesthetic practices which, um, which help to prepare us to engage in that work. Um, and and those, those aesthetic practices build on other aesthetic practices that have helped. That's why it, it never ends. You know, because you have to keep going. It, it moves in, in, in round like that. Um, so you, you see what people are doing. You see what people have done. You see how people have responded. And, and you, you try to replicate it in your response so that then it can be replicated again. Because um, cause we, we can't stop. Um, so... I'm just sort of lingering as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, it's, it's just so depressing, you know, like the situation that this archive speaks to is very depressing. And I think, um, yeah, like thinking of the politics of repair is, is almost as depressing as the situation itself because it is impossible at this moment and and I think I return to this notion of stillness um, that I started with because I think for me at least and I only speak for myself um, spending time with this work I think just reminded me with how much bigger the land is really and um, there's like an enormity to it and I'm not even speaking about scale as much as like sort of a fortitude that remains long after we're gone that I find really comforting. Um, 
And, you know, just listening to the sataba, it's like a really, I mean, it's just strange singing to a grave, you know, but I think there's like a sort of, and I think that's the acceptance, like accepting that this, you know, like there's a cycle and we're a part of it. And, but there, but it also comes with a certainty that we are a part of it, you know? And so, yeah. Uh, thank you for letting us sit in on this conversation. Um, so, something that just struck me in this work was um, maybe a certain relationship between, um, you spoke of uh, art that maybe comes about without the individuated artist. And I was thinking about um, swarms and like self-organizing systems and things like that uh, in relation to the, the sound quality, um, which often I thought was droning and not in a derogatory sense, in a really wonderful sense. And uh, finally, just um, especially in the last piece, uh, the relation between that and, and threnody and like the wailing ode or lament. And I was just wondering if anyone could speak to that a little bit. Sorry, can you just repeat that last part? Because I didn't get it. That last sentence. Sure. Uh, I'm just thinking of um, threnody, which is the, the wailing ode or the lament and maybe the relationship between loss and droning and swarms and these kind of things. Actually, I mean, it might be interesting. Yeah. No, go ahead. Other questions. I was going to say it might be interesting to play a video when, um, from Iraq in response. Which one? The, uh, which is the collective morning one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to play this because I, I, I feel in a way the uh, the last cluster that we saw, it almost, um, you know, in that relationship between form and content, that's why when Fred was talking about the form, I found it really striking because there is that very strong relationship. Um, you know, this is a, a you know, a, a collective, Right moment of mourning and lament, and their voices and their bodies become the resonators, in a way. And of course, there is this call and response. Um, and and I think in a lot of ways, what we tried to do when we were creating the clusters was to have that call and response that had like even more multiplicity of calls and responses. Right. So that that feeling of even in those sort of individuated moments this kind of collective or ensemble emerges, but it doesn't smooth over the tensions, right? The, the, the fact that it's not this smooth experience e either. Um, so I think in, in, a, in a way that's something that we were trying to translate in, in how we think about the moments and how we formally sort of bring them together then, yeah. I don't know if Fred and Alia or Basil have anything to add. Yeah, I was just going to add that there's the it, the form the to what Ruan was saying that the f that we would try to like also like make the work a call itself as well in the form that it was taking. 
So whether it's about a call for like open access or open call or a call for like reading things in a different way, um, yeah, and like in the form itself as well, like we thought about that. The the one technical term for like a the sort of self-organized shifting swarm of say a flock of starlings is murmuration and it's a great word because you initially one thinks that one is dealing with a with the phenomenon that is primarily or, or uh, visual but murmuration reminds you that it is also an, an oral uh, experience too because one hears the murmur that is made by the the, the flapping of wings, you know, and so this is pretty, you know, Nick, you've written about this, you know, uh, and that particular mode of clapping of, you know, in, in black vernacular, you know, in the U.S. we would call it, you know, ham bone, juba, um, where the body is also, where the body, one makes one's body into an instrument or a resonator. I've never seen this particular mode of clapping before, but what's amazing about it is that it produces a certain kind of visual illusion when the hands cross one another that, um, that's bird-like <laughs> in its precision. Um, uh -huh. It's actually this great old song the greatest version of it is Nat King Cole, uh, Tis Autumn. And then the birds make their decision with birdie-like precision, <laughs> turn about and make a beeline to the south. But, but, um, but I, I am, uh, you know, I think it's not an unusual or accidental thing that there's just a lot of people nowadays um, who are struck by, by this phenomenon. You know, I mean, Saidiya Hartman writes about it in a beautiful way, and Nick Nirsoff writes about it in a beautiful way. Um, and you know, these are these modalities of, of social entanglement that, um, that are induced by brutality, but that are also at the same time the continual enactment of what it would will have been to to defeat the brutality, you know, and um, and so yeah, that's that's a you know it's a cool thing, you know, because it it's a cool thing when you have reason to revel, even if it's only for a second, in the fact that mourning sounds like mourning, you know. Um, Well, thank you so much. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm so intimately familiar with this video. <laughs> um, so, and I wanted to share with you that the way also you, it's um, you, you presented. I mean, this uh, relationship between mourning death and celebrating life is actually exactly how I make sense of Thawra Tashrin or the October uh, slash um, revolution slash uprising in Iraq, in the sense that really what is at the core of it is that the 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 space. I mean, it's reclaiming space, like you, like you said, but the space of protest really became this mourning space, and even Tahrir Square itself became a shrine where we circle the coffins of the of the shuhada of the martyrs and at the same time the centrality of women as, as being batalat al hayat the hero of life and 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 them actually saying i am here to honor a shuhada i'm not even here as a woman or as, with a certain political agenda i am here my agenda is to honor the, those lives and and give them also afterlives. So it's it's really powerful for me to 
to uh, see it deployed in, in such a way. And, and I always have the feeling that um, my work as a sociologist is, is often so limiting in the sense that I'm trying to put in words what can be also showed in images in, in, in a way that is much more powerful. And the limit also of, of trying to stick to an argument of, of, of this scholarship that is always trying to contain, right? As opposed to what you have done, which is also showing, of the, showing us at the same time different views points that was super super powerful but I have a little maybe I mean question maybe discomfort as well uh, especially because I mean when I see for example this video and majalis that I have myself attended I also know I mean that I'm not sure <laughs> that these women would like to be also shown in in public in front of an audience and and it's it's a tension it's not like a, a critique I'm, I'm even when I want to show images of the uprising or of protests or, or certain scenes, I'm always getting back to actually words and presentation and because I'm, I'm too, there's, there's something that doesn't make me very comfortable. So I, I was wondering how you think about that. I mean, we think about it a lot, obviously. <laughs> um, and I, I think it's a tension that remains. It's not something that you resolve. Um, there were, you know, some sort of, you know, guiding principles for us, which is that um, everything that we have here already at some point existed online. I mean, some things have been, uh, you know, a lot of content from Palestine, for example, was suppressed and, and, and so on. But um, I think that was one of the first things that, that, that you know, we... Um, collected material that was already in this virtual public sphere. And then there was another impulse, which was that actually it's such an, you know, the internet is such an amnesiac site, right? It's like an amnesiac archive. Um, and, you know, in many ways, what we were trying to do were sort of actually honor these people and these moments and these traditions, right? Um, so, you know, and at the same time, of course, there's always um, the issue of the gaze, the issue of how, and in, you know, in the installation, for example, we don't actually have a lot of archive material for that reason. And if the archive material um, uh, is is there it's it's in the negative so there's always something withheld so it's about also yeah it's about um in in some way yeah averting capture but i think on on the platform because these materials are already there so so you can actually follow the link to the person who uploaded and and you know go to the whole yeah. so really is what we've done is we've brought them together and so, ha you know, keeping that link and that trace and, and is, is very important. Um, and that's why a lot of this material, for example, is not in the installation. So there are these questions always for us. Um, and there's a lot of material that we didn't actually put up as well. So there was a lot, most of the material we have was not put up. This was like a So selection it's, you know, it's a constantly well. thinking about these things, you know, and, 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 and how, especially an installation that goes up in a museum, you can, you know, disrupt that kind of fetishization that can happen, which is very cannibalistic, right? And, and you don't want to, you, you want to find a way to stop that, you know? And, and, and so, you know, we were very um, purposeful and kind of like careful in how we used certain moments and then sort of inverted them so you can actually make out the features of the, of, you know, and we had a whole conversation about this, Alia. You were asking me why we were doing that, and I was explaining that, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much for this uh, uh, really fascinating afternoon. I, I, he named me, so I should identify myself. I, 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 I you know, the, the mentioned Nick Mirzov. Um, I just wanted to mention quickly, like, one of the things about murmurations is we don't know what they are. The bird folks say, well, maybe they're for resisting predators, but then maybe they're not. Um, and there's a kind of data pattern 
But there's also something about it that's just kind of fun. They just do, the birds do it kind of for fun. Um, and I, you're looking at this amazing work. It was, in, in one way, it's like what the digital always wanted to be. It always said it was going to be like this. And it just, I mean, as Fred said, it just isn't. And I can't help but notice, I mean, because my digital screen is like this too, that you've got a little British flag flying above your space. <laughs> as if, like, it's always already colonized, right? And yet, so, I mean, I kind of felt like the question your work is asking is like, what would the relationship between the visible and the sayable be if it wasn't colonized? Or if, if it wasn't platonic? Or if it was somehow able to express what it always wanted to say? And I, th I was wondering to ask you if you feel like where this work sits in relation to what's called post-cinema. Because in some ways it visually looks like that. But then what you've been stressing is it's not. It's temp the temporality that you're expressing is a before. Like that the everything is incomplete here. And I felt that looking at this. I mean, I felt when there was a little Berger clip up at the beginning on the middle of the frame, where he talks about undefeated despair, as, which is something that is yet to come. And in, in that sense, there's a kind of counter-visuality which is yet to come, which is not about visuality at all, because visuality is always about empire. So it would have to be something that we, in the way that Fred was saying much more articulately than I can, we know what it is, but we can't say it. We know what we want, but we can't make it quite be that yet. Uh, and so, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking about, you talked about it as the ephemeral, and when visual culture got going back in the day, that's what art historians said it was. They kind of couldn't figure out what it was, so they said, oh, it's the ephemeral. And so, like, we're not in Venice. We're in ephemeral land. Um, but maybe ephemeral land is the place we want to be. Um, so I, I, I just wanted to ask you to, to, to maybe just say a little bit about what the relationship is to post-cinema and, and where it goes and what it wants to be, uh, and just say thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the right time to ask this particular question, um, seeing as there was an open one already. Um, my name's Khayyam al um, Hi. Um, I, I'm going to take this opportunity to, to assume that this is a safe space, and in, in Fred's um, uh, manner of not wanting to upset anybody. Um, I'm gonna, yeah, just try and ask a question in the in the uh, what's the word in the most sensitive way that I can. Um, I got a little bit triggered uh, watching the last video um, of the Iraqi women who were um, uh, uh, doing the lat latmiya, which is the, the I, I don't know the word to translate it into English, but this is essentially like a self-flagellation, um, and 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 that's a self-flagellation that comes out of the despair, right? So, um, and the reason why I got triggered is because because I'm Iraqi and that's quite quite close to me. But but what I guess what upset me more is that this event today was supposed to be a listening session. And we, we've been talking about sound a lot, but actually all we've done is watch. Um, the, the visual has been a, a key element of today. And as we got to the end of that video, the, the video was silenced, but the, the picture was allowed to continue to play. And yeah, I, I'm not trying to cr critique. I, want, I do want to open up a question here, um, which is, I felt like much of what we were experiencing today was actually not sonic, but it was a kind of, it's verbalization. It's, it's using language and song at times to express the injustices and the despair and, you know, the, the we know all of the other um, terms for it. So, and I felt like by turning this into a discussion about sound, what we've done in a way is actually remove some sense of meaning, leading us to interpretations about swarms or murmurations or um, anything else that, that somehow re has removed the, 
the very personal and the very um, palpable pain of the images that we've seen, and it has somehow aestheticized it in much in the same way that the, the negative inversion of the image of the man being uh, brutally brought down by the Israelis in the middle of the street was aestheticized, and, and the same way that the sampling of the voices was aestheticized in the artwork, the dance piece you showed earlier. And so I, my question is, wh how, how much do you see this as a, about being sound versus being um, a visual and uh, a representation, but also what about the role of language? Obviously you care very much about it because you've translated and transcribed everything in the archive you've presented. But I feel like the visual is always leading and I, and I feel like it's somehow misleading because the context is not very clear um, in the terms of that, um, in, the terms, in the sense that the sound itself can, can sound like it's all the same, but, it, but the meaning behind it really isn't, you know, and uh, yeah. I don't think it's about one or the other. I think it's, a, it's about being. So um, it's not about, I don't see it as like these kind of demarcated sort of like sound and image and that's not, you know, that's not what it, that's not what, what it's at the core, it's about being and it's about breathing and it's about resisting and it has all these different utterances and what's uh, incredible is that it, it, it is existing on all these levels. It's existing as video, as sound, as poor image, it's being shared on all kinds of different platforms and, and, and circulating um, in all these different ways and I think um, it has all these lives and afterlives and in all of that there's a lot of mutation right and contamination that happens um so i i don't see it as like i think it's it there there is a certain um level of density and complexity that is uh that is there and then you know within that something emerges um and then about the aestheticization, again, I see it as um, thinking with this material and through the performances about how we can become essentially unbound from colonial capture and how, how do you do that. And sometimes it is in breaks and glitches and stutters and samples and in these broken parts. And it, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a it's a practice, and I think it it can be and is meant to be disconcerting at times. Uh, but but don't you think that somehow this reperpetuation that Fred was mentioning earlier is occurring here too? The reperpetuation is also occurring if we're if we're it, in a way a lot of what what we're what, what my um, understanding of what we've seen today is a kind of resampling in a way, in, in much the same way that sampling was subversive. That's what I get from, that's what I get from what you're saying now is that these disturbances and utterances and um, disruptions are, in a, are a method of subverting the, 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 the colonial status quo, let's just call it that. But but I, I, I'm, I'm not sure how much there is a subversion and how much there is a reperpetuation re because as, as much as, as you've taken so much effort to allow access to the original source material and therefore give those personalities that are in the videos their, their space in a way, right there, I also feel like they're somehow being aestheticized and being used. And um, th that's where I feel like it's, it's a dilemma. And I, I'm, I'm not, again, I'm trying, not trying to criticize, I'm just trying to um, think in, out in the open because I find these questions and, and dilemmas very, very difficult to deal with. Um, 
how, how can we disrupt and subvert um, and amplify these voices but we what, are part without of these de voices. Without, they're not. They're not apart from us. They am. They're not like of apart course. from us. They are a part of us. Of course. And I think that's the distinction. I think the performers are working with material that they. It is a part of them, and that's what I was saying. It is theirs and not theirs. It is their wound and not their wound. This is not something that is. We are like it is at a distance. It is a part of us. You know, so I think that that is a really important. I agree with you. I agree. You know, with you. I, I mean, if we see it as all the time apart from us, then what what what, what are we doing there? What like what what is that? You know, what does that mean? You know, anyway. Yeah, I, I I think you're hundred percent right because we we all suffer this whether we're uh, in diaspora or not. I think we all suffer this, and and you're right, hundred percent. I just I find it difficult sometimes because I feel like those voices that don't have we ultimately by placing them all in this one space and calling and referring to them all as material, then we ultimately putting them all in one box. So we are d d detached. This is maybe how I'm feeling now is that there's a sense of detachment and maybe it's just this is coming out of that, you know, being triggered by the video and what happened earlier. But um. hi, I'm Helga. It's nice to meet you. Um, I actually had a very different, actually, reaction um, to what I just heard, which is, for me, there were times when I decided not to look because I just wanted to listen. And what that made me realize is that part of what you're doing is actually challenging what vision is. Um, because if you just, if I just listened, and or even if I just watched only the performances or what was being, what was moving on screen, um, it gave it the sense of a continuation of mobility of you know you could hear the ups and downs and these kind of I don't know what you call them like but uh, waves right um, whereas looking at the screen I I just saw screens right so it was very sort of contained so if anything I actually ended up interpreting this piece as very much challenging what it is that we're seeing and yet forcing us to think about the continuation of those sounds and those movements and of, of obviously the sort of political messages below those. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, uh, Rowan, Basil, Fred, and Alia for this fascinating and important talk and also I'm grateful for everybody who's asked questions, but I feel like this is a really generative conversation, primarily because I had the privilege of very expensively taking a class with Fred last semester. Um, and, and one of the things that happened in that class was, and Fred, please correct me if I'm wrong, but you kept talking about those people being uh, nurtured and uh, sacrificed into power. Uh, and Fred, you can elaborate much more um, eloquently on that as you would like. But I think that uh, this is going to be seen at MoMA, correct? Eh. Sorry. But Fadlan, anything that happens in MoMA is essentially being sacrificed to power, right? That's the Biennale conversation. And so, and it's moving us forward. I too felt that discomfort of. Um, uh, because what we're ha what's happening here is we're subordinating, uh, and, and not this is not a critique. This is because you did this, we can have this conversation, uh, and I'm very grateful for that because this archive that and this piece that you guys have created feels infinitely generative for me, and so for that, I just I just feel a moment of integration right now that I feel moved to share, um, and I'm also recalling in. 1990, the 1996 Kana massacre, Al Jazeera took all of its sound off the air and just had the images rolling on screen. So they silenced the screen and it was just image. And so now what we're asking for is sound. This is an evolution in the discourse and I'm very excited for that we're here in this moment because I think that sonically there is that alchemical possibility that we all kind of need collectively for change, be it happening in our body with our interactions with art. Um, 
And so I, I'm just going to wrap this up, but I think that what might come of this sort of moment of, that we're having uh, in different fragmented ways based off of who we are possibly in our experiences um, is, uh, I don't know, I feel like we're in a moment of alchemy together just watching this. And, and I, I guess I can pivot this into a question for you, which is, what has this done alchemically for you and your body uh, and in your practice? And, what, what, and not to say that something should be productive. If you want to say, fuck this, خلص, nothing more, معلش, that's fine. But uh, where to and what's happening in you? Thank you. I think we might have time for one more question, but I want to give them a chance to... So if there's a pressing one, otherwise let's turn it over to you all for a kind of final word. Um, uh, uh, that last question, what has it? Uh, I, I think in, in many ways, um, and, and why my answer to Khayyam was it's about being, is that this project was a way in which we and the people we were working with in Palestine tried to understand the conditions that we find ourselves in and what we can do in those conditions. And what we ended up thinking about was this idea of being in the negative together. Um, so actually, our work is very much anti-representation and anti those modes of, of, of thinking and it's very much about being. I mean, we've been working on this for 10 years. The, the, the work with the performers happened across three years and these are people who are our friends. These are, the, these are people who we've been collaborating with for much longer than that. So it was really about being together and understanding what it means to be in the in the negative um, for us now in Palestine and how we can you know use that to generate a different way of breathing essentially in conditions where we should not be able to breathe and in conditions where there is a constant push to erase you and it's being experienced on every single um, part of your your own being, but your collective being as well. So, 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 you know, in a way, the installation is just is just one articulation. For, for us, it's that being together and that process that that is everything. That that is the work. And also, I will say that the performances where they were filmed were all places that are being attacked by settlers. It was about us going to those spaces together. So th it's not a representational work. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's something that was lived and, is con and continues to be lived for us. And um, yeah, it continues to be a way to think about how we can resist that erasure, yeah. No, yeah, I would just I would just add and pivot off that that you know for the longest time we've been insisting on you know with every project we ask like who cares you know why are we doing what we're doing um, all the time and while we're working making the work and um, our primary audience has always been like our people that's who we make work for because um, even though we show it outside of those contexts most of the time because of you know this sort of complete system that we live in that where you don't have an outside to actually be um, but essentially it was a sort of something that we purposefully um, before we even started creating work we worked only on sound because we didn't know what to film or we didn't know what image we could use and we didn't know how we could try to change the images that are being produced from Palestine and, the, and, how, and bring back a certain potency to those images that had been repeated so many times. 
Um, so, so I think that, you know, <clears throat> we all get really used to creating work with Western audience in mind, that we forget that, you know, that's not where we exist, you know, all the time. We don't just exist in these uh, spaces. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to pivot off that. Um, yeah, just sort of final words. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to sort of, first of all, thank Khayyam and Camilia for this last sort of two really great um, interventions. And I think I wanted to emphasize that th this is definitely a very uncomfortable work you know, to sit with, like, this is my, this has been my experience um, with it, and, and I always come away with this feeling that there's no single way of accessing it, and it's really elusive, because, you know, you could be, you know, this morning I was watching the news of Jerusalem, you know, as you know, Ramadan, uh, annual sort of clashes uh, taking place, and, and then I opened the archive, and I just felt this sense of, you know, um, overwhelming despair. This is like the same cycle repeating itself. And, and I think it also complicates the notion of an archive. This is not an archive of past events. This is ongoing, it's open-ended, it's repetitive, it's circular, it's non-linear. Um, and it will be very uncomfortable at different vantage points, you know, uh, at any given moment that you sit with it. And and there are other moments where you're listening to a love song and you're not looking at the screen and that's contemplative and beautiful and poetic and so you, you get that too. Um, but yeah, I mean, I agree with Camilla. I think the really, the beautiful thing about this work is that it is generative and it is incomplete and it will never be complete because there's an infinite amount of material that will never be captured ever. And that's, that's the sort of the paradox of an archive. It's, it's more about what it does not contain. Um, so, yeah. Unless Fred wants to make some final, final words, I think. Please. All right, on that, I want to thank you all for coming out. I want to especially thank our four speakers. <laughs>